Howdy folks, hello and welcome to today's live stream. Today I'm going to be talking about SQL Server interview questions. I ran a post on my blog this morning talking about asking y'all what some of your favorite interview questions were. And I got some really interesting uh, comments, things that made me think about the questions that I'd been uh, answer asking before. Eamon says, good evening, boss. Good to see you again, Eamon. Eamon's been some of our training uh, classes lately. And uh, good morning to Khalid. It's 10 p.m. Oh, you're like, what? you should be in bed. What are you doing watching me talk about job interview? Maybe you have a job interview tomorrow and you're super stressed out about it. Uh, to, there was someone who posted in their weight stats. This, w um, this live stream will not be about analyzing your weight stats. I may do another one of those again in the future, but not doing that one in today. Today, I'm going to be talking about some of the cool interview questions that folks posted over on the blog. And on mine, the first the one that I put in, I said well, the, the interview question that I liked the most was out of everything on your resume, what's the thing that you're proudest of? The reason why I love asking that is recruiters will constantly tell candidates to stuff everything in the kitchen sink inside their resume. They're like, have you ever taken a backup? You should put backups on your resume. Have you, have you ever seen analysis services? Okay, let me write that down too. Because recruiters are playing the keyword bingo game, trying to get past their client's human resources department. Let's be honest, the recruiters and the human resources teams don't really know anything about SQL Server. They're just looking to see whether or not some basic common keywords get met. And then to get you on past the first round and into an interview. So when someone hands me their resume, when they hand me their resume at the start of an interview, I, I know it's not really them and I want to get to who they are. So that's why I like asking, okay, so there's a lot of stuff in here on your resume. What are the things that you're the most proudest of? And I'll tell you what, when I do this in person, when clients have me interview DBA candidates, which is always kind of comical because sometimes in person they'll walk in and they'll be like, oh my God, Brent's conducting the interview. Either they're really happy or they believe they're screwed. I had one person uh, who walked in and his face just went white when he walked in and he's like, whatever I need to do to get this job, I'm getting this job. Because if they have Brent do the interviews, I know we're going to have a good time. I was like, I like this person. Of course, they're brown nosing, but brown nosing is uh, good for points. Uh, but one of the stuff that I like about that, the, the stuff that I like about having them just talk to me about their resume is because often I, I'm kind of a little bit of tricky. When someone's in person, I don't give them a copy of their resume. I have their resume. And I'm not trying to trip people up. I'm not one of those people who likes to play Trivial Pursuit. I don't want to ask you impossible trivia questions because I suck at those kinds of interviews too. I don't want somebody gauging me on what are the parameters that you need to pass into SysDMDB index operational whatever. Just So I want to hear just them. I, and plus some of it is getting them to be relaxed because I, I know interviewing is stressful when you want the job and I want to give you a chance to win. I want to give you every chance to win me over. So I'm like, out of all the stuff on here, I only want to talk to you about the stuff that you're the most proud of. And, and uh, Richie says, what about wine pairing? Would, would you like a rosé, sir? Yes, I, I could probably give them a drink and then go see if that would loosen them up some. So this question just really helps me focus in on the parts of their resume that they're the proudest of. And some of the questions that people put in in the blog post kind of relate to that. They kind of use that as a jumping off point there too. So coming back over here, the next question that people said was, out of, so this is what BZ sent in after BZ saw my interview question. BZ said, okay, on that technology, the thing that you said you were the most proudest of, how do you rate yourself on a one to 10 scale? I love this question because it's also awareness. It's also self-awareness. You know, some people are humble. Some people will rate themselves like a three or a four when I know doggone well that they're some of the smartest people in the industry. 
Because as your career progresses forward, you're always looking up. You're always looking at other people. You're always looking at the people who write the books, the people who write the blog posts, the people at the product team who write the features and then go off to presentations and present about them. So you always feel like there's someone else who knows more about it than you do. Some of the people I know at Microsoft who work on the product teams actually rate themselves low because they look up to customers who seem like they find all kinds of bugs. When someone tells me they're like an eight, nine, or 10, it sets off alarm bells. And I, I know people who, as soon as they hear the eight, nine, or 10, it's on like Donkey Kong. Like the interviewer's like, watch this. Now I'm gonna make it a mission in life to, to stump that person. I don't, I don't like doing that. But what I do like doing is I say, okay, Oh, uh, uh, Ashbird says the screen says offline. Has the discussion started? It has. Uh, let's make sure that the post is actually showing. Um, ooh, it says offline. Oh, no, it is. It's, it's streaming. You need to refresh your browser. Uh, so I'll tell SSH, uh, try refreshing your browser. How about a call? Tall. Crisp, refreshing glass of refresh. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you refresh your browser, you'll see the live screen. I know I just because I pulled it up on my iPad. Uh, so uh, when you when someone says rate yourself an eight, or they rate themselves an eight, nine, or ten. Um, what I like to say is, okay, so who do you believe is a ten? Like, what what do you think is a ten? What does being a ten mean? And if being a 10 means that they know, because maybe they really are, you never know when you're interviewing someone, but as they start to elaborate about all the things that they know, one of the other things that I'll ask them is, if you're an eight, nine, or 10, tell me how you give back. I want to hear about how you mentor others. I want to hear about how you share what you've learned. Uh, I want to hear about times that you've taught other people uh, to do some of the same things that you're doing so that uh, everybody's on the same page that you are. And if someone says that there are four, five, or six, like if someone rates themselves really low, I'm not giving up on them because often people are very humble. You know the deal with imposter syndrome. A lot of us feel like we're not really that terribly good at something. I would rate myself fairly low on a whole lot of topics. And then I know people are like, oh, you're, you know, you know everything. No, 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 no. How the hell would I? Amidly says, what would you rate yourself? So it depends on, if I'd answer the, the, answered the previous question, so I'm going to jump back one to the previous question on there. If you looked at my resume and you said, Brent, what are you the proudest of? I would say teaching people how to make queries go faster. So it's one thing that I'm pretty good at making queries go faster, but the thing that I'm proudest of is teaching other people how to make their queries go faster. Like I want to have a developer walk into my office, you know, as such as it is, and me go teach him, all right, here's what's going on inside your query. Here's what you want to do next. <laughs> Eamon says, where is your resume? True story. If you Google for Bren Ozar resume, it's out there. I don't think I've updated it in like five years, but it's out there. So then if you ask me on, your, on that technology, how would I rate myself on a 1 to 10 scale, I would say that I'm a 9 at teaching people to make their queries go faster. And the pe person that I think would be a 10, Itzik Ben Gan is right up there. Uh, Eric Darling, I think, is right up there. There are other people that I really respect in the query tuning space, so I think that they've got it even better on query tuning and even better on training. When I look at some of their demo scripts and the way that they tell stories, that's phenomenal stuff. The, Hiram asked on a related note, I loved this question. Out of all the things on your resume, what are you the least proudest of? What this tells me when someone tells me they're the least proudest of something, I'm not talking about that they did a dirty job or that they're ashamed of it. It tells me what direction their career, that they want to go, grow their career in. I know people who believe in that your resume must have everything that you do, must have every single thing that you do, including the things you don't ever want to do again. There's a point in my life where I went and looked at the uh, looked at my resume and I went, oh my gosh, on here it has taking backups and doing restores. I don't ever want to be involved with that again. I don't want to be the person who's on call at 4 a.m. when the data warehouse goes down because some yo-yo for you know forgot to put in a where clause in their restore. 
And I realized that I could edit down on that resume and I could just have the things that I really care about, the things that I was really proud of. Well, before that, I had some things on my resume that I wasn't proud of, like backups and restores. Because at the end of the day, I'm like, you know what? Backups and restores, they're, not, they're hard, but they're not really enjoyable. And I don't find that as something that I want to go towards in my career. When I'm asking people interview questions, some of it is to make sure that I get the right candidate in the job. Some of it is to make sure that I don't get the wrong candidate in the job. It's not about skills. It's that I want to make sure that you're successful in a way that you want to be successful. Sometimes people are just desperate to get out of a crappy job that they're in now, and they'll stay in the new job for like six months or a year, but the timer's already started, and they're already looking for an exit route. So if the things that I need them to do on a daily basis are the things that they say they're the least proud of on their resume, then I just got to know that they might take the job today, but there might be a time bomb on it, like that they may not make it so much uh, further longer. So let's see what's next on our questions list here. Oh, I loved this one. Adam in the comments said, explain the difference between a view and a stored procedure. Duh. Uh, so uh, many says, uh, I too don't mention the stuff that I don't enjoy in the resume. Yeah, it's one of those, team Brent, it's one of those things that once you learn it, it becomes more intuitive. Uh, explain the difference between a view and a stored procedure. So a bet, I bet a lot of us in here go, well, of course I know the difference. Okay, now explain it. As in, when do you use one over the other? And when is one a bad fit? I'm not really looking for, of course, anybody who's worked with SQL Server for a length of time has a rough idea that these two things are different, but how do you explain to me the difference between those two concepts? If I can ask you something that I'm pretty sure you know the answer to in one shape or another, and I'm not even looking for accuracy, I'm looking for how you communicate it. Because when you look, when you work for databases, when you work with databases, eh, sometimes we feel like we do work for databases. But when you work with databases, a lot of your job is explaining to other people on other teams, the sysadmins, the report writers, the executives explaining why you need more money, whatever, not for you personally, although maybe that's the case too. Uh, but explaining to other folks complex concepts, because really a view and a stored procedure is, those two are hard concepts. If you had me answer it, the kinds of things that I'm looking for would be, in a stored procedure, you can run multiple commands. You can go set things up. You can go call other objects like another stored procedure. Do a few uh, cursor-based operations, for example. It would be a bad idea, but you can. You can do row-by-row-based stuff. You can manage transactions just inside stored procedures. You can have branching logic that goes off and calls other things. Whereas a view is really just syntactical sugar that lays on top of the database that makes it easier to query. It's great for selects. You can even use it for inserts, updates, and deletes. But the thing it's really, views are really good for is just layering an abstraction layer over the data itself. Can you do that with a stored procedure? Yeah, just a lot of people don't do that. You rarely see shops that actually have a stored procedure for each table and doing the CRUD operations. This one's tricky, and Sean Dolan, when he uh, posed this one in the questions, Sean was careful to reinforce what he was looking for out of here. Sean said, tell me something about SQL Server that I don't already know. Oh, I know it sounds cocky. It sounds so terribly cocky, like, look, I know everything, and you're not going to stump me. But it's more about finding out whether or not this person is excited about something. Is there a topic inside SQL Server that they believe is, is rare or unusual? And is there something that kind of makes them infectiously excited? Sean is looking for someone who has found joy in some part of the database. Um, if, if I asked that one, that would be so interesting to me. If someone had me do that during an interview, I'd be like, okay, here's the deal. When SQL Server queries start, they have this thing called a... Uh, <laughs> Eamon says, your answer was great. I would uh, take it if I get this question. Um, 
I would take it. Uh, I would love to answer it with memory grants. I love the concept of memory grants in SQL Server. I find them so interesting that when your query starts, when your query takes flight, SQL Server has to guess how much memory it's going to need, and it has to make that guess without looking at the contents of the tables kind of has to use some, some prognostication and your statistics and guessing how many rows are going to come back and how much data is going to be in each of the columns, then finding out how much it's going to find in other tables. And this memory grant is set in stone at the time that the query takes flight. Now that starts to change in 2017 and 2019. Batch execution mode will go and ask back for more memory. SQL Server has adaptive memory grants. It's just now starting to get to the point where well, I always thought SQL Server was before. I always thought it would just ask for more RAM if it ran into problems. And then that goes into an interesting discussion too around TempDB. I, I like Sean's question here too, because I like these open-ended questions that let you explore with the person about the thing that they're passionate about. And you can't teach passion. It's just so much more intoxicating to find someone who's been really into it. <laughs> Richie says, uh, tell me something I don't know. Brent Ozar writes terrible queries. And he's right. When I'll tell you, when I started doing open source, when I wrote SP Blitz and I published it out on the blog and I started giving it away for free at conferences, I thought the first reaction that most people would have, I thought they would go through my code and recoil in horror. Because I don't know about y'all, but I bet you've written utility scripts and you're not particularly proud of the work that you do. You're just writing something in order to get the job done, in order to get to the next stage. And when I wrote SP Blitz, I'm like, someone just handed me a SQL server. I need to know if it's full of angry hornets and bees or if it's actually a, a good SQL server. So I wrote just quick and dirty utility queries trying to find out what was going on inside that SQL server. So I thought when people opened that, that they would be horrified and that I would develop a reputation for Brent Ozar writes terrible queries, which is true. Richie will tell you that. But uh, as it turns out, people just want to see you giving back. People want you to uh, go in and give back to the community, give them other uh, reporting queries that they can go and use. And really, at the end of the day, a lot of us, even when we're doing work for our quote unquote day jobs, a lot of us don't go through really rigorous code review. And a lot of us, after all, if you're in a webcast like this, you're already going above and beyond what a lot of people do. I know a lot of people who work for, with SQL Server, and they just treat it as a check cashing kind of thing. They're there to cash a check, and they don't have any excitement about it. They don't ever go sharpen their knives. They don't want to learn to get better. They are doing the bare minimum that they can in order to get by. Eamon nails it. Eamon says the result is always more important. Yeah, I want to see real business value come out of whatever it is that we're doing. That's why also when I do my query tuning classes, I talk in Mastering Query Tuning about using a half hour hourglass. So I keep a, a half hour hourglass on my desk. And this reminds me, slow through the times of our lives. If I flip this thing over, I have to produce real value within a fairly short period of time. And if a half hour goes by and I haven't produced real value for the business, it doesn't really matter how good my T-SQL is. It just doesn't help that much if somebody can't get data out over on the other side. Uh, VTOL freak. V so I, I assume you mean vertical takeoff and landing, uh, or so like v vertical takeoff or landing, whatever they. There, there are some of those. I live in San Diego, right down by Coronado, and there are some of those planes that will have the pivoting. I think they're called Ospreys that have the pivoting wings that have the end, big giant uh, propellers, and they switch from helicopter mode to plane mode. And I'm just amazed. Those are awesome. They are so cool. All the SEAL guys and all that, they get so much cool stuff. Ospreys indeed. Ooh, I got it right. Uh, but it's neat. We're in a high rise and I look out all the time over at uh, San Diego and stuff is flying by. I'm like, oh, that, that looks like a lot of fun. And they're still up and going even with uh, the virus thing going on again. Um, but VTOL Freak says, the thing I was the most proud of and most ashamed of, stealing other people's RAM, using buffer pool extensions to RAM disks on other ESX hosts. <laughs> You must wash yourself with hand sanitizer after that one. That is bizarre. Oh, 
buffer pool extensions to RAM disks. Wow, that is like a, that's fantastically, that's like what's that anchor man line? I'm not even mad, I'm not ashamed, I'm just impressed. It's amazing. Uh, next interview, Ily or next interview question, Ilian submitted this one. He says, where do you go looking for answers when you aren't sure how to solve a problem? Oh, I love this. And the, the reason why I love this is I want to see the kinds of initiatives people are willing to take before they escalate to a senior. There is a beautiful line, a, a judgment line of how much work should you do individually before you ask someone else for help. When I'm hiring someone who's more junior than me, I want them to go far enough. I want them to put in enough work to go Google. If we get to the point where there is a, uh, someone hasn't even Googled in order to find the answer, then I know we have a problem. Like if they just come directly to a senior as soon as they've got any kind of question, hey, I'm trying to shrink a database, what should I do? Well, you should, you should go Google. You know, that's what, that's what Google is for. Um, if we get to the point where they're not Googling at all, then I'm concerned. On the flip side, if they're willing to Google, copy paste uh, things from strangers directly into production and go hit execute, or another one of my favorites, I find copy pasted code directly from Stack Overflow put right into production without even really understanding what it's doing, that's bad too. There's a line there, and I just want to open a discussion of what do you do, and then how long are you willing to spend on it before you bring it to your senior? I don't think there's a wrong or right answer to this. I just want to see what their thought process looks like. In a related uh, interview question, Mark M. asked, who are your favorite sequel authors? I should be on the list. The way that I, I've always had a similar question, and it kind of piggybacks off of the last one, I say that when you're Googling for help, who do you usually find in the results that's the most useful? I want to know the kinds of places that you copy paste. <laughs> exactly, Eamon says copy pasting from renozar.com is okay. Um, I, I want to see where you copy paste uh, results from. If your answer's always books online, I'm a little suspicious. Like I should expect other sites to pop up in your search results from time to time. I don't uh, include the URL of the three queries before they ask me. Jeff Atwood says that in another way. He says, I need you to go walk over to the rubber duck and go ask the rubber duck uh, a question. Books on lies. I've never heard that before. That's actually really sharp. Um, but I, I don't know about Mark's. So the only thing that I don't like about Mark's question is it assumes that people have enough spare time to sharpen their knives. So sometimes they don't. Sometimes, sometimes people are looking for a job because their uh, current employer works them too hard, doesn't give them any free time, doesn't give them a time to learn. These people also have family commitments outside of work, and they can't afford to dedicate their own personal time. I know some, some bloggers and presenters will say, look, everyone has to sharpen their own knives all the time. I expect you to spend one day per week uh, reading about SQL Server. I don't. I expect you to clock out at five. I expect you, not you, Richie, you, that, that's different. I get back to work. But I, I expect people to clock out at five and go on with their lives and go do other things. If you have a love affair with databases, sure. It, it, it's okay if you, like I know I have a love affair with databases and I'll read white papers when I'm out on vacation. But I don't expect everybody to be like that. I expect people to clock out at five. And I know that a lot of, <laughs> Richie says sips drink, and it's Tuesday, no, it's Monday. I don't even know what day it is. Uh, but the, the uh, I, I, use, I know that some companies won't give people enough spare time. They can't go watch webcasts at work. They have crappy office firewalls that won't allow them to go read uh, social media sites or won't allow them to go watch webcasts. The boss thinks they aren't working. Um, uh, Amadil says, except when you're the only dev in your family company, I hate the Friday afternoon desperate request. Bad news, that also happens 
when you're in big companies. <laughs> uh, which brings up an interesting Mipsy Tipsy on Twitter is a, a favorite follow of mine. Mipsy Tipsy works for or started an observa observability company. And she's like, you should be comfortable deploying on Fridays. You should be just as comfortable as deploying any other day. You know, things are going to break. And I love that whole debate. There's a passionate debate in the observator observability uh, community about when it's okay to do deployments and when it's not. I find that popcorn munching uh, kind of time. So let's see the next question that we hit. Oh, uh, time to take a break and talk, uh, say thanks to our sponsor. So our sponsor this week is Century One. Century One is running a free webcast with Kevin Klein and Danny Cherry talking about the top five tips to keep your data and applications highly available. Both Denny and Kevin talk constantly at big, huge conferences. It's rare to see the, the uh, opportunity to see both of them present live. So by all means, get over there and go to brentozar.com slash go slash top five tips. The webcast is totally free. And of course, let's be honest, you're not going to any conferences anytime soon. So you need all the free training that you can get. Next one's a little weird. Uh, so Doug says, how do you feel about documentation? I have a tough time with questions like this because how do you feel about is awfully open-ended to me. I, I have a love-hate relationship with documentation. So I like where he's going with this. Yeah, he likes to enjoy us drinks for uh, documentation. So here's, here's the question that I ask instead. And I'd never asked this before until I read his, but his made me reword it as, what do you look for in good documentation? Because that way, I want to hear their, you know, hear what they, uh, uh, complicated relationship is right. Yes, it's a love-hate. I, I love to read good documentation. I hate to write good documentation. But when I thought about Doug, that uh, question, I want to say it was Doug that wrote, yeah, Doug Coates that wrote this. I, when I thought about that, I thought, oh, what would I answer that at? It's like, what do I look for in good documentation? And you know what I look for? Is a copy-paste friendly example. I look for, yeah, what was I thinking when I wrote that code? It reminds me of, of one of my favorite Stack Overflow comments. So if you go to Stack Overflow and you search for best code comments, so let's go hit Google and we'll look at Stack Overflow Best Code Comments. There's this great question, and I'll copy paste this and put it over in Sla or in uh, in chat so that y'all can see it. Um, and it's been closed now because it was opinion based. Uh, this is back when Stack Overflow was much more fun, and we were allowed to post things without getting them closed. Uh, but this is one of my favorite answers right here. When I wrote this, only God and I understood what I was doing. Now only God knows. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Um, and Richie nails it. I'm like, the, the things need to be documented. You, you, they just can't be, you know, roughly hinted. In Postgres, we're running into a problem right now where the, there was an undocumented connection timeout feature. Uh, many says, I show the colleagues to, or code to my colleagues to explain it. Yes. I know people say good code is self documenting. I don't believe that for a minute because what I really want to know is what's the business purpose of this? Why are we running this? What is this for? Yes, if I read a 5,000 line long stored procedure, I can maybe kind of fumble out that this is about the year end process and calculating the state taxes with four different sets of exception. Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting one. What uh, database management system is best in your opinion? And I've had that question in interviews. And the way that I answer that is, to me, they're like musical instruments, like five different brands of pianos. There's the SQL Server piano, the Oracle piano, the MySQL piano, the Postgres piano. A good musician can make any piano sound great. A bad musician, the instrument isn't going to save him. If you sit me down in front of a piano, I can't even bang out chopsticks. And it's not, it doesn't matter whether you put me in front of a Steinway or whether you put me in front of a Yamaha or some trinky tink or thing that you found over at uh, uh, Salvation Army. 
Yeah, my favorite one is the one that I get to use. If as long as I can get to go get to use it, I can work with whatever. Like Richie and I switched over to Postgres when we went and built uh, SQL Constant Care. And I'm like, I, uh, so much of what I know about SQL Server still applies with Postgres. It's, yeah, I have to learn some different UIs in order to make it work. But at the end of the day, if you can play one piano, you can probably play another piano. It's not going to be quite as easy as sitting down at another piano, but it's pretty doggone close. So like in terms of a religious war about which one's best, ah, to me, they all suck. The more that you learn about any database, all databases suck as you start to get to know them more. All of them just suck in weirdly different ways. Oh, this was so tricky. And I want to hear the answers to this one. I'll give you all 10 seconds to put your answers in in Slack. If you got this question during an interview, what would you say? So, so wild, lorem ipsum is good. That was very good. I like that a lot. Uh, never heard this one. Best guess, don't know, no clue. It isn't a real feature. Gets up and walks out of the door. It isn't a real feature. Someone was asked this by a manager who wanted to find out how their DBA would handle a question that they didn't know the answer to. And I love that. That was so genius. Because after all, a lot of us are faced with things we don't know the answer to. I love hearing, I don't know. Like, I don't even want to hear you guess. I just say, I don't know. But here's where I would go look. That's the thing I usually want to hear from people. If I show you an option in SQL Server that you've never seen before and I ask you what it is, I want a very fast, I don't know, but here's where I would go look. Don't BS me. Don't try to go in and go, well, I, I think that's uh, it's related to fill factor, but it's for uh, slightly unused uh, data. No, just if you don't know where the edge is, just admit that you don't know. You'll be so much better off. Now, Monty said that when he got this question in an interview, he felt very angry when, because he said, I, you know, I, I don't know. And the manager told him, oh, I don't know either. I made that term up in order to test you. I'm like, oh, Monty said he was very angry about that. And I was like, you know what? I kind of feel with you, feel you, because I, I think that I might be a little angry if I got a question like that too. But at the same time, it's also kind of interesting to see how people handle stress. Because if you handle stress well in an interview, well, you'll do fairly well in your day job. True story, just thinking back to uh, some of my own experiences in interviews, there was a time when I was interviewing a, a data person. And that data person, as we're going through this interview in like a boardroom type situation, the person got increasingly agitated with every question and was clearly stressed out about something. And I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if, if he felt like he wasn't ready for the job or what it was. Uh, but got further and more and more agitated throughout the entire interview to the point where he was holding his head between his knees. He was talking and giving answers with his head down between his knees. And I, I'm looking over at the other people in the room and they're all, their eyes are getting bigger. And, and we got done with the interview and I just said to everyone else, it's like, I, he, he knows what he's doing, but he doesn't handle stress well. And I, I'm worried about what's going to happen if we put him in charge of something and that something explodes. You know, how's he going to react with stress? Actually got the job and didn't handle stress well, but that's a story for another day. Uh, so let's see here. Next one up. Uh, Parker. Oh, this is a great question. What's your approach to error handling? Oh, I love this. You talk about something where I want to hear somebody pop up right away and go, I don't know. I work with so many companies. I see so much T-SQL. I've worked with people all over the world. Uh, had people write quit, uh, code for interview questions, write code for real life stuff. Yeah, Corona, just when the story was getting interesting. Yeah, I always wanted, just in case the person's watching the webcast, you, know, you never want to go a little uh, too far into there. Um, but what's your approach to error handling? Nobody handles errors. Oh my God, everywhere out in the world. And you look in my own scripts, it's the same thing. You look at SP Blitz cache, any of that, or SP Blitz, SP Blitz index. Kendra had an SP, uh, like a try catch inside SP Blitz index. I think the first time it came out, I was like, oh, what is this sorcery? 
you know, I just don't, you know, Richie's different. Richie says, speak for yourself. Richie has a lot of error handling, but that's because Richie is a developer. Unlike most people in SQL Server who kind of pretend to be developers, but they don't actually know how things like transactions and error handling work. So it's, there's a huge and unit testing, debugging, you know, our idea of testing in, in uh, SQL servers, pull the cable and see what happens. You know, that's our example uh, for testing there. So I love this in that Parker goes, I just, I just want to hear what their feelings are and whether or not they've ever done it before. And that tells me a lot about them as a developer and programmer and uh, database administrator, because we DBAs have to handle it too. You know, we've set up those agent jobs that don't always work in the middle of the night. I don't know that I would ever fail someone out of an interview for an answer to this, just because I know that it's so rare to find people who actually do do error handling. Uh, but it was interesting just to hear it. That was kind of cool. Mark asks, what's the latest version of SQL Server that you've used in production? And this isn't meant to screen people out. What this is meant to hear is the kind of shop that they're working in now, because this is a really neat one-two punch. What Mark follows up with is, out of the newer versions, the ones you haven't played with yet, what features are you looking forward to trying? <laughs> Richie says SQL Server 6.5. I, I really like this, but there's a, this comes back to not everyone has the time to uh, work with SQL Server in a, in a passion or keep and read up in a passionate capacity. We don't all have free time to go read about versions that we haven't played with yet. But it does tell you if someone is making time to do that kind of learning. And it helps you drill down because if they say, I'm really look or looking forward to trying column store indexes, for example. Then you can drill down and go, okay, why? What, what is it that you think is interesting and cool about column store indexes? Because that also tells you the kinds of challenges that they're facing in their current day job and that they're excited to solve, that like that they've had to struggle with, well, my reporting queries run really slowly, and uh, I'm really frustrated with that. I'm, I'm hoping that column store, based on what I've read, the batch execution mode is going gonna, is gonna to help me out. And then that lets me drill down deeper and go, oh, so, so you're struggling a lot with reporting queries. What are the kinds of challenges that you run into? Because the challenges that they're running into in their day job today, the more that they've uh, beaten their head against that wall, the more that they'll be able to help solve some of those problems in our own shop. So I'm always very excited about that. For me, um, for that, uh, uh, Ash Ashman says, uh, Ash Asharaman says, do you ever think SQL Server will be replaced with some fancy data store that all the data scientists love to use, like Hadoop or Spark or whatever? The thing with data science is often people have to do one-off projects that data science will, scientists will be brought in to solve a problem. They'll be like, okay, we need you to find out why our customers are churning so frequently. And it's a project with a defined start and end date. And data scientists can pretty much use whatever tool that they want during that start and end date range, as long as they've answered the question by the end of the end date. So I always expect data scientists to rapidly be using different tools. They're going to keep using different tools that are popular at universities. There are always these free developments, you know, teams coming out of universities because college students have to build stuff. They throw things out at Apache. They you know, constantly incubate new open source projects. They always have new ways of solving problems. Cloud vendors come up with new ways of solving problems. And data science teams are a great incubator for those kinds of projects. Relational databases are a little different. Relational databases, you don't want to keep changing the tool set because what happens, imagine that you build the back end for your company's website, for example. Well, once you've got the data in a database in a web for a website, for example, you're going to start building more and more things that integrate with that, that want to run reports, that want to pull things out on a scheduled basis. You're going to build an API for it, all that. And so with relational databases, they tend to be the stone that sits over there in the corner. And once you start relying on that stone, you don't want to move the corner stone. That needs to stay there for a really long time. I do think 
that if you're a startup developer, if you're building a brand new application from the ground up in the year 2020, you probably don't want to use a relational database that costs $2,000 per core US, $7,000 per core US for Enterprise Edition. Those numbers are staggering for a small company in a garage. You know, the people who are building brand new applications, especially when you see uh, like uh, all kinds of rapid scale startups that all of a sudden hit the hockey curve, the hockey stick curve, they're a little hesitant to spend thousands, tens of thousands of dollars on their database backend when there are free ones out there. So I, I think that, that the startup area has already been kind of eaten by MySQL and Postgres just because they're cheaper databases to start off with. And uh, Atafashi says, are graph databases fancy? Oh, fancy like as in costumes or? No, uh, don't know about that. So let's pop over to our next one. Uh, let's see here. If we needed to migrate a database with low downtime, what are our options? Oh, that's really cool. Oh, uh, what do I think about implementation of R, R, Python and R by Microsoft and SQL? Because it's not an interview question, I'm going to leave it off. Like that isn't the kind of question that I would ask during an interview. Um, if we needed to migrate a database with low downtime, Kapil asks, what are our options? This will tell you whether people have had to do it or not. And that if they haven't, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I know some people who've always worked for nine to five shops, companies, doctor's offices, uh, 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 trading firms where they're only open between nine and five and they don't have to worry about stock trades after nine to five and they can have much more flexible downtime and some other hours, not hedge funds obviously, but whatever. Um, and so some people have had the luxury of saying, well, we can take a weekend and, and do log shipping or we can do a full backup and restore or copy files over or whatever. Um, but if someone does have an op answer for this, then it starts to open up the conversation of, okay, tell me about a time where you needed to migrate a database with as little downtime as possible. What were the challenges that you ran into and what do you wish you could have done differently? I also like this because it's kind of a timeless question. There are always all kinds of answers going back through different versions of SQL Server, and I just want to see their decision-making capabilities. How did they evaluate their different choices out there, what their safety net looked like, things like that. Oh, Joe gets into the soft skills questions, and Joe says, tell me about a time where you really struggled to collaborate with a coworker and how you handled that. Depending on what role you're going for, DBA, for example, and DBA, say you want my job. If you're a DBA database administrator, DBA equals default blame acceptor. We get thrown under the bus for all kinds of things. And we constantly have to uh, go back and forth with people and say, all right, I, I know you want to deploy this code to production, but I don't really think that this code is quite production ready. I think that there are some changes that we need to make. Or maybe a, a project manager comes in and is like, I need system admin access right now. I want to go install SharePoint directly on the production server. Or maybe you've got a manager who just absolutely refuses to give you any more horsepower for the SQL server and you're trying to come up with a collaborative solution. This how you handled it, this is the tough part. This I'm not worried as much about their ability to build bridges. Me personally, what I'm more interested in is who do you not get along with? What are the kinds of personalities that you don't get along with? Uh, that, that'll help enlighten whether or not they're going to be a good fit for the personalities that you have on your team and whether or not they can help to start bridge some of those, bridging some of those differences. Uh, how often do you use Envercare Max as a data type? I, did, I don't know that I would ask that as, a, as an interview question, um, but I might ask something a little bit different. I might say, what would you use an Envercare Max for? What are some good uses for an Envercare Max? What are some not so good uses? And what are the drawbacks? I do bodybuilding. Nobody ever complained directly to me. I wear a t-shirt and I uh, works every time. Yeah. Oh, oh, you show off. You just like, uh, what do you do? The Arnold poses whenever you walk through. Yep. That probably handles the collaboration thing. They're all like, yes, immediately. That and you uh, have blood all over your shirt. And you have a knife visible coming out of your pocket. I can see why that would be a little tough to get past human resources. 
Steve says, what do you get your, or what do you do when, I say Steve, way out west, because I, I know who Steve is. Unless someone's impersonating Steve, which is always a possibility. Steve, show me your Hawaiian shirt. Uh, Steve says, what do you do when you, another co-worker doesn't get all their work done on time and you are depending on them? He says, <laughs> no, it's me. Um, that's, that would be a very good one because the, as database administrators and as developers, systems administrators, all of us in IT depend on each other. It takes a village to raise an application. Uh, so yeah, it's a really good question of how do you incentivize people in another department to get their work done on time. Me personally, I like having a conversation with the person just separately and just go, hey, is there anything stopping that I can help you with? Is there anything standing in your way that I can help knock out of the way for you? Is someone else being unreasonable to you? Is someone coming and asking for all kinds of things in your spare time? Is someone pestering you? Do you not have the tools uh, that would help you get this uh, done faster? Is there an online course that we could help with? Just total open-ended. Is there anything that could help? because I'll go to bat for that other person if they need something, like I may be able to be persuasive. And that also kind of helps to send the subtle signal of, I want to help get things out of your way. What's slowing you down from doing this faster? And it also helps me understand maybe what I thought was easy actually isn't all that easy and is going to take some hard work to get done. KD, with, and I, I reworded his a little, or his or hers a little to make it shorter, because it's kind of kind of drawn out there, but uh, I like this question a lot. Tell me, without incriminating anyone, tell me about a project that you were involved with that failed, and then in retrospect, what could you have personally done to stop it from failing? I don't expect retrospective things to come out from uh, data professionals very often. It, a lot of our work is under the gun as fast as you can, go, go, go. And not a lot of us take the time to step back and think about, okay, what worked well over the last month? What didn't work? What could I have personally done to get better? Um, I do like this as a self-reflection question. I just wouldn't expect anyone to come up with a really fast answer in a matter of milliseconds. This is something that I would expect someone to have to, to think about for a while. Even thinking about a failed project, you know, that can even take people some time in order to, to come up with. And if someone says, I've never been on a project that failed, that also tells me something about them as well. They're either an excellent liar or they're extremely lucky. In one of those cases, I want the person on my team. In one of the other person cases, I do not want them on my team. So then last up, I'll ask you, what was the worst interview question you ever got? And I'm going to tell you about mine. So the worst question that I ever got was, I sat down in an interview and the, the person who came in to do the technical interviewing immediately came after me. They were going, okay, so what would you do if you were having TempDB contention? You know, if you're just facing TempDB contention in production. And I started talking about, well, I'd look at the number of files in TempDB. And it, it, every time I started saying anything, the person immediately answered, we tried that. I was like, so I'd, I'd think about, you know, so how many files do we have in TempDB? I'd try to set up either four. Or, we tried that. So, well, maybe I might look at, uh, you know, out of the weight stats and go see whether it was actually page latch contention or whether it was something else. We tried that. And, and after I said three or four things and immediately the person said, we tried that every time or that isn't it, you know, said right away. I said, it sounds like this is happening to y'all. It sounds like that this is a problem that y'all are struggling with right now that, that is giving you some difficulty. And the person doing the interview, <laughs> the person, I'm already laughing. The person doing the interview goes, uh, well, we've been, you know, yeah, we, we, we've got to fix it. You, this would be your job is to go fix it. And I said, oh, I said, so how long have you been working on, on uh, fixing it? Like, oh, six weeks now. I said, have you, I, it sounds like you're, this is the kind of shop where you got Microsoft involved too, that you've opened a support call. They're like, yeah, we, we've got to, we got a support call open. We got to fix it as soon as possible. And I said, just to set expectations, are you looking for the kind of person who has the answer to a problem that has stumped you for six months and that Microsoft hasn't been able to solve yet? They're like, yeah, yeah, that's your, you're the DBA. You need to be able to do that. 
I was like, okay, I, I'm probably not the person for you. I, I guess I don't have that skills. I said, totally no offense. I'm not upset. I'll to you can send the next interviewer in. I'll, I'll just go ahead and gracefully decline. I'll, I'll leave because it was a team situation where there were several interviews in a row. And so the person gets out and leaves and sends the, the head hiring person back in. And I said, I'm going to be straight up front. I didn't get the job. That's okay. Um, I said, no hard feelings. And they said, well, how do you know? And I said, well, there's this last interviewer. They're clearly facing a, a technical problem. And I, I'm, I'm not a good fit for that. It's, I would love to solve it. And uh, they, they talked with me a little bit more at length about it. And it turned out that the person who was asking the questions wanted my job. They wanted the job that I was applying for, and they were purposely trying to throw as many roadblocks as they can, could in front of other candidates. I was like, damn, oh, that, that makes more sense now. And the manager's like, now you see why we're going to keep going with the interview. And I said, no, 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 and now you see why I'm going to leave. And they're like, what? I said, no, if that person is throwing things in my way before I even start, then when I start they're still going to throw objects in my way. And I don't want to have someone who walks in the first day and there's a knife behind my back waiting to stab me so they can take over for that job. Oh, God. Uh, so uh, Richie says, Richie says, I walked in for an interview and uh, immediately was handed a programming test. I like the FizzBuzz one too. Whiteboard programming? Oh, I hate that. God. Well, if my, my, prop, my job involves programming on a whiteboard, then I'm going to quit this interview right now because I would suck. Um, Junior DBA says, in this era of cloud and multi-database environments, what, path is in, or what, uh, what career path is recommended for someone just starting as a SQL Server DBA? Should I specialize or uh, like get deeper into performance tuning, or should I be a jack of all trades and know a little bit of everything? Here, I, Buck Woody, a person who works at Microsoft, brilliant presenter, can't say enough good things about him. Buck Woody has a great line, and he says, in, in a mature environment, in a mature time, a mature technology, things that have been out for a really long time, you should specialize. You should have a very sharp knife go very, very deep. However, in a very rapidly changing environment, you should be a generalist because it's hard to know where to place your bets. If you bet very deeply on like Hadoop and then Hadoop disappears like it did, then all of a sudden you're screwed. Didn't doesn't pay to be very deep in there anymore. There are only a handful of companies that are going to hire somebody who specializes exclusively in certain parts of Hadoop and nothing else. So if, what I would say then as an answer to that is if you fell in love with SQL Server, that's a mature technology and you should specialize. For example, you should go into performance tuning or high availability and disaster recovery, whatever it is that you fell in love with about SQL Server, keep pursuing that love. If you didn't fall in love with SQL Server and you're thinking about some of the other stuff that you mentioned, Power BI, Python, containers, SSIS, Azure Data Factory, cough. See, that happens a lot to people. They cough a lot when they say that. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in one of those other technologies, then you should be much more of a generalist because those other, other technologies are changing much more rapidly. So you have to be able to be prepared to jump onto another horse as it's riding through. The, the uh, times of NoSQL databases were a great example of that. When NoSQL databases first came out, you probably didn't want to bet your entire career on one of them because they were coming and going like people at you know uh, uh, last call at a party. They were all over the place. What you might want to do is just know the technologies and be able to be fluent in a few of them. Personally, you can probably kind of guess what my answer is because I specialized. I fell in love with SQL Server, and then beyond that, I fell in love with specific areas. I fell in love with going faster, and then I went from just hardware and sand tuning and virtualization. I got closer and closer to specific things. Eamon asks, do you feel good or bad about someone who stays on average one year on each company of their career? You know, in life, there are... There are all kinds of reasons why someone might have to change horses. 
Sometimes it's a bad company. Sometimes it's the company goes down the toilet. Sometimes it's a bad coworker, a harassing coworker. Sometimes the company decides to go with a technology that you're not really interested in. Sometimes you have family changes and you need to move or you need to follow wherever your kids are at. So I always assume that they had good reasons for it. And I don't want to drill too deeply into there. What instead I would ask is, what would be the kind of company and the kind of position that you want to stay at for the next five or 10 years? What's the kind of work that you're massively in love with? Because the benefit of jumping around like crazy, there are a couple of benefits. One is if you do it right, you make a lot more money. You know, if you did it right, you jumped up the ladder instead of jumping, you know, sideways. Uh, because sometimes people are really fast learners and they're able to skyrocket up the corporate ladder. Um, other times people are moving laterally in the same job across, say, 10 years. That's a warning flag for me in the sense that if they're not holding steady in the same, uh, at least region or industry or whatever, that there might be a problem. But on the flip side, they might have found something they really loved. So I've met people who found the one thing that they love to do me. I found the one thing that I love to do. Tara Kaiser is another great example. She's got came out of college, went into database administration. She's been a database administrator for like 15, 20 years now. She found the thing that she loves to do. And so she's moved companies only when better opportunities present, but it's not like she's job hopping. She just found the one thing that she loves to do. And sometimes companies don't no longer need database administrators on a particular team, or there's a toxic person, you want to change teams, whatever. So I, the one year jumps don't bother me that much. It's are you making progress or did you find the thing you really love to do? What is it that's, that can get you to stick around in a company for a longer period of time? Uh, Adafashi asked a question, but it's not really re related to interviews. Um, Zakaro says, I think that's a difficult to answer question. Uh, I'm assuming that it's this the worst interview question. Uh, beyond it depends on the, oh no, he's answering the, the size of the database thing. A. Middles asks, would you rather hire someone with lots of experience, say 10 plus years, but no education, or someone with education and little experience? I'm, I'm probably a good example of that I dropped out of college. So I went into college, I had a full ride scholarship, national merit finalist, um, everything was totally paid for, I was accepted into UC Berkeley and all kinds of other places and I ended up going to the University of Houston because they had a really interesting computer lab and they were as far, they were really big in the internet back you know, when 20 plus years ago, uh, 20 years ago I guess, um, and it was really far south. I was tired of living in the snow. I wanted to get as far south as I could. I love Mexican food, you know, the culture, all that. Dropped out my third semester. Could, couldn't stand it. Didn't like college at all. College did not agree with me uh, because it wasn't really practical. It wasn't very uh, hands-on. Um, so for me, I can totally understand how college isn't necessarily related to what people do in their daily business. Um, one of us, one time, uh, Jeremiah, Kendra, and I, three of us who uh, co-founded Breno's R Unlimited together, three of us were doing a webcast and someone asked a similar question and we looked around at each other and we're like, none of us are doing what our degree said. Like I was a dropout, Kendra was a philosophy major, Jeremiah was an English major, I think. None of us were even working with whatever we'd uh, accumulated college debt for. Um, so to me, what college is more useful, if you got a CS degree, if you got a computer science degree, that's different. Uh, but if you are if you just got an unrelated degree, the thing that that's useful for me for is measuring that you can achieve something, that you can set out a long range goal and achieve that goal. But I wouldn't care about your, Carudo says I'm a college dropout. Yeah, it's, I, I don't know about y'all, but a, a lot of people that I know who ended up in database work never really planned to go there, either didn't get computer degrees, didn't get computer science degrees. And even if you did, computer science degrees are useful, but they're probably not useful to what a lot of us do every day. I mean, like Richie's different, Joris in here is, is different because Joris does development and architecture work and all that and he has to think more big long-term scale and drawn out. But database people, it's a little different. Steve says, Way Out West says, I chose databases because there were better pay there than a developer. That was my philosophy when I got started. I was originally went in hotels and then gradually went into IT. My philosophy was I want to stand near the most expensive thing in the room and wait for it to break, which in this case, the most expensive thing in the room 
is of course that thing down there. Um, but be, be it the most expensive thing you can find, wait for that to break. And in a lot of shops, that's databases. Uh, and that's where you stand near something expensive and you'll make a lot of money when, it, when you fix it. <laughs> and that's a weird flex. Uh, well, I'm proud of it. That thing is pretty cool. It's uh, fantastic. It's smarter than I am. Works faster too as well. All right. Well, that's everything for this webcast. I want to thank again Sentry One being our sponsor uh, this week. They have an absolutely free webcast with Kevin Klein and Denny Cherry talking about, let me switch over here, talking about the top five tips to keep your data and applications highly available. Uh, you can register for it over at brentozar.com slash go slash top five tips. Uh, thanks a lot, and I will see y'all later. Adios.